On Being with Krista Tippett is supported in part by the John Templeton Foundation, funding research and catalyzing conversations that inspire people with awe and wonder. On the Templeton Ideas podcast, they dive deep into conversations with astrophysicists, psychologists, and philosophers, exploring the most awe-inspiring ideas in our world. Learn more at templeton.org. I've been following the actor Carrie Washington's ethos and evolution for a while now, and when I heard that she was publishing a memoir, I was happy for the chance to draw her out on being style. She played the uber-glamorous, tough-as-nails Olivia Pope on the Peabody Award-winning TV series Scandal. That was a quintessentially American character, even as it pushed at some cultural norms. But Carrie has also brought moral rigor to very different kinds of roles, including in Little Fires Everywhere, Django Unchained, and American Son. I was in the audience for that show on Broadway, and I was aware of the care and intention Carrie personally put into bringing a racially mixed audience not just into attending, but into participating and reflecting together. She says to me in this conversation that she approaches acting as a devotional practice. And that is such an interesting way into the high drama that is the human condition. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Kerry Washington's many other film and TV credits include Save the Last Dance, Ray, and The Last King of Scotland. Her new memoir, her first book, is Thicker Than Water. In it, she explores many things about which she's not spoken publicly before. She grew up in the Bronx with two loving parents, and yet in a home harboring a great deal of tension and an important secret. I would like to just note here as we begin a detail that feels important, that you were born in the middle of the night— on mm. which the final episode of Roots aired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Just to place your yes. birth in time in a way that was meaningful to your father. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, was that a story you heard? Did he really convince the nursing staff to watch in the waiting room with him? He did. He really did. <laughs> um, this is, you know, my dad, as I share in this book, is a wonderful storyteller. He's one of the best storytellers I've ever been able to witness. And I've learned a lot about how to tell a story from him. Um, Although I'm really good at ruining a joke and he's not. He's a great, (laughs) he's a storyteller and a great joke teller. Um, But he was so excited about that final episode of Roots and he convinced the nursing staff. So in the delivery room, it was my mom and the doctor. (laughs) Um... (laughs) Her OB, but um, but the nurse. Luckily, I was born at one forty four in the morning. The next mm-hmm. morning, so they were there for the most important parts. But in that earlier labor, she was on her own with the OB. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> it's funny. Well, so perhaps this next question won't surprise you, but I am <laughs> curious. I am curious, and there's really no overt mention of this in this book you've written or kind of in other things I read. I'm really curious about how you would think about the religious or spiritual background of your childhood, however however you define that now. I'm just having a moment because I've heard you ask this question to so many guests. <laughs> I'm like waiting for your amazing guest to answer. I'm like, oh, it's me. It's you. Um, okay, so one would have thought that I, I would have prepared an answer, but I haven't. Uh-huh. So, um, you know, I grew up going occasionally to an Episcopal church. Mm -hmm. Um, My mom was raised in the Episcopal church because my grandmother was Anglican, Episcopalian, you know, from the Caribbean, very, you know, Jamaica, so very British culture in Jamaica. So the Anglican church, the Episcopal church was Mm -hmm. really important to my grandmother. And we all myself and my cousins, my aunts and uncles, we went occasionally. There was a church that we belonged to, St. Andrew's Church in the Bronx. And um, we didn't go every single weekend. We went in fits and spurts throughout my childhood. We went on important holidays. um, And that was kind of the 
the spiritual framework. We also said grace at dinner. Mm. Um, my dad or or whoever, if it was a large gathering and there was like a, a more senior member, it was offered to that person. But m- more often than not, it was my dad doing grace. At small meals, big meals didn't matter. And that was kind of the framework. We, we weren't a very religious household. We weren't a very spiritual household, but we followed kind of religious culture and rules. You know, there wasn't a lot of swearing, although there were mm-hmm. these exceptions. Like <laughs> even when I was a young child, I mean, I, I don't, I would have to look up the exact year, but I was definitely not in my double digits yet when Whoopi Goldberg did her one woman show on Broadway. And I was obsessed with this show and I memorized it from front to end. And my mother mm. used to let me say all the swear words because that was art. <laughs> but but outside of that, you know, we, you know, you don't say the Lord's name in vain and there wasn't a lot of cursing and we sort of, we were gently, mildly religious, mm. gently, mildly Christian. Yeah. I did, however, have a godmother who I do, I still do have a godmother, my Titi Angela, um, who is a Santera. So she was yeah. a priestess in Santeria, which is um, like a really beautiful religious practice, belief yeah. system that's kind of a combination of Christianity and indigenous African uh, traditions. And um, so there was a lot of openness and kind of open-mindedness around what religion looks like and is, but it always kind of had a Christian lens. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I have come to say, you know, that my lens on everything is the human condition. And for me, mm. the great spiritual traditions are, as much as they're asking about what is beyond us, right, they're also asking about what it means to be human. Um, mm. And I really, as I as I kind of was reading you and watching you and delving into the body of your work and other interviews you've given, it really felt to me like, from a really early age, and you've said it different ways. You said it this way in your commencement speech at George Washington University in 2013. You said, from an early age, I was fascinated with people and how we become who we are. Mm, and it mm-hmm. really start, has started to feel to me like that is a thread that, that runs all the way through and that I kind of want to pull all the way through mm, this conversation. Mm-hmm. Like how you've gained wisdom about that and worked with that as a human being and also and through mm. living with your craft of acting. Mm, mm-hmm. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that idea. And, you know, just to begin in childhood, which is uh, that soil of everything that follows, mm-hmm. you know, I want to read a little bit from, from your wonderful book, Thicker Than Water, this memoir. Um, and to me, like this passage is an example of this very strange and mysterious thing about story, which is that it can be when we speak with the greatest vividness and honesty out of our own intimate experience that we also speak to universals. So this mm. this feels mm-hmm. like this kind of passage mm-hmm. to me. So I'm going to read this. Um, when people ask if I am the first actor in my family, I often <laughs> joke that I am just the first to get paid for it. There are no other performing artists in our family tree that I know of, but we, my mom, my dad, and me, are a family of performers. Each of us has spent a lifetime playing a role vital to our shared narrative. My role in our performance came naturally because I was born into its twists and turns and draped in its masks and costumes. We three were the picture-perfect presentation of ourselves as we wanted to be perceived not only by the outside, but by each other. We were a fairy tale portrait of success, and this was the only show I knew. We performed it all day long, and for years, this script was how we avoided pain, messiness, and discomfort. I mean, that's an astonishing mm. passage because it's about mm. you and it's about all of us, right? Mm. Mm. But but would you say a little bit about what was that role you took on and what that made you inside as as you've continued to live into again and work with and evolve? Mm. Wow, what a great question. Um, so I guess I would say the role that I was born into was a role of support. Mm. It was it was a supporting character in the story of my parents' lives. 
And in a lot of ways for me, writing Thicker Than Water has been my attempt to step into the role of lead character in the story <laughs> okay. of my wow. life. Yeah. Um, and so for, for to be the right kind of support in their journey, I was always looking to support the narrative that held them up, that held our family up, kind of this idea of black middle class success um, and intelligence. And um, we were a family that purported to, and not even purported, we were a family that like really enjoyed culture. And um, we held a place in the community that was one of service and generosity and leadership. There's a sense of elegance to how my family mm. walks through the world. Mm. And, and all of those traits were kind of handed to me unconsciously and, and I danced along. Um, and it, and it felt, it felt, um, at the same time, both very right. Like I thought this is, these are our roles. These are our proper roles. And there is a difference between the role and the being. So I always knew that it was a role and we felt very well cast in these roles. Like they mm -hmm. were right for us, but there was more, there was right. something underneath it, some kind of raw humanity that was yes, underneath the, the mask. Drama. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. And that part I was, and, and that part I was more confused about mm -hmm. and didn't understand as much because it, to me, they almost never took off their masks or they only mm -hmm. took them off, you know, late at night when they thought I was asleep or in the other room and didn't know that I could hear. And, um, so, so, and, and so I definitely didn't know who I was behind my mask. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, let's say your parents are still married. Is that right? They are. Um, they are. They fifty-one years. Fifty-one years, and mm -hmm. and yet that marriage. Um, well, all marriages are complex, but it was quite a dance and a duel. And as you say, you write about, uh, yeah, kind of experiencing it um, in in the night. I mean, you once you wrote somewhere about later that you recognized there was this hyperventilating little girl who lived within you who was probably formed um in that way in that time is that right mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm -hmm. i think um i love letting people know that my parents are still married yeah. and um and that they are they have a really beautiful relationship you know they um it took a long time for me to learn that although it was my whole life, it felt like they, you know, when I was a young child in my single digits, that it felt like my whole life they had been fighting. But even my whole life was a small fraction of their relationship. Mm -hmm. That there were many years before me and there were going to be many years after, you know, my maturation, my leaving that home. Mm -hmm. And that every relationship, every marriage has its ebbs and flows um, and its peaks and valleys. And and, you know, they are, I think our relationship, the three of us, is so much closer and more intimate and beautiful and honest than it's ever been before. But I would dare to say that their relationship with each other is also more intimate and honest and open and beautiful than it's ever been before. Yeah. I watched the, um, you did an interview with your mother, um, Oh, it was a long you talked time ago. about Simpson Street Production Company, oh, which you created, oh, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. And, which is named after the street in the South Bronx where mm -hmm. she grew up, and that was such. Mm -hmm. It was really beautiful to watch the interaction between the two of you. And I mean, she does seem extraordinary, Doctor Valerie Washington, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yes, professor, <laughs> a professor of education, and and um, so all of this. It's complex the way life is complex and the way families are complex and the way marriage is complex. And there's so much also that's beautiful and redemptive about it, and none of that cancels each other out. I feel that's like right. you really bring all of that into relief as oh, in thank that way. You. Um, and one thing you said about her is that she, I mean, gosh, the life she lived, right? Um, mm -hmm. Becoming a professor when for such a long time perhaps much of her career, in many of her academic situations, she was the only person of color. Mm -hmm. um, 
And you said that she was, you know, at once warm and reserved. I like that language you use of elegance because I'm not sure you use that word, but that absolutely comes through. And I saw that. Mm. I saw her mm-hmm. on the mm-hmm. on YouTube <laughs> with you. Um, and you said that so she was warm and reserved, and and that perhaps was part of the role that was given to her, right, to carry yes. what she was carrying. Yeah. But you. We're never reserved, it doesn't sound like. No, my poor mother. (laughs) And that helping you into children's theater companies was part of her giving you what you needed, I think. I think so, you know, but I I think that was sort of God's sense of humor, right? Like she had really learned how to be this elegant, stoic woman. And then she had this child and I was like a walking id. I just was Mm. like one big feeling after another. And... I'm so lucky that because she was an educator, because she's such a generous spirit, because she has been such a brilliant, devoted mother, her instinct was not to say, stop having feelings or go sit in a corner and shut up. You know, her instinct was to say, let me find a place where you can explore all this humanity (laughs) and do it in a way that's, that I'm not in charge of having to help you navigate that. Um, And so I, I learned to be able to have big feelings and be really expressive on stage. And I knew that it was welcome there and it was rewarded there. Mm -hmm. And when you went to the Spence School, that also coincided with this becoming really part of who you were. And I think, didn't you get an agent also when you were well, I did in, in that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. During yeah. my years, in middle school at Spence. In middle mm-hmm. school. And um, you you speak of yourself as becoming kind of an anthropologist uh, and, mm-hmm. and very actively and intentionally as you actively and intentionally became an actor. And I find mm-hmm. that such an interesting word, and it's mm. so interesting to hear how that manifested. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, this. I was really lucky that my parents are so geared toward academic success because I really have always seen myself as a learning actor or as a as a student actor, the way you talk about like a student athlete, right? Like I've always Mm -hmm. seen myself as a, as somebody whose commitment to academics was as important as my commitment to the arts. And at Spence, I was really given room for that identity and that approach to flourish. Like I remember we were studying Hamlet while we were doing Hamlet. And for my final paper, I was allowed to keep a diary as Ophelia. And so I had this diary that became more and more insane and deconstructed. Like I even figured out how to have the handwriting look more and more crazy as she lost more and more of her faculties. Um, And so that kind of idea of approaching the work, not just in a creative play way, but in a way that called on my intelligence and my critical thinking thinking and my um, my ability to to do a deep dive on on larger themes and on specific details and to to really really excavate the truth of a character and of a narrative that that started early for me mm. yeah I mean I was just writing down some of the examples and there are lots I mean I you do this with every role but I don't know even even when you were um, your junior year at George Washington University, you were playing a frog, <laughs> and you studied frogs. Or yeah, we did. We went to the zoo, yeah. which is part of the Smithsonian. We went to yeah. the zoo, myself and another castmate, and we observed. We got to meet with the experts in the amphibian house, and we observed the frogs. And it served me. I guess you know, I learned early on, like it provided me with some physical behavior ticks that I could bring with me. There's a a thing <laughs> right. that frogs do with their feet, like a constant tapping and a a breathing pattern. And that specificity in detail really grounds the work Mm -hmm. and allows me to kind of go deeper, to really sink in to the role. But even, I mean, here's another one. When you did this movie called Lift, you actually did some shoplifting. (laughs) 
I did. To have the experience for which you later in your way very subtly without confessing to your crime atoned. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I, you know, when I look back now, I think what I was chasing was truth. Because I grew up in a household where on some deep level, I felt or knew that there was some truth that I was being protected from or some reality that was being kept from me. And so I think I became like a heat-seeking missile for honesty and mm-hmm. for truth in performance, in life. Um, I, I always wanted my work as an actor. I want, not wanted. I, I always want my work as an actor to feel like it's full of the truth of humanity and as specific as possible because those moments of um, vague omission or vague disconnection, Mm. it was terrifying for me as a child. Like I I didn't know what I didn't know, but I just had a sense that I didn't know everything I needed to know. And that dis-ease was, I think, part of what laid the groundwork for what I hungered for in life and in my work. I mean, again, what you just said, you know, so many of us could have our version of that. And it's Mm -hmm, so fascinating, mm -hmm. the particular way and the particular craft um, into which you channeled this. Um, (laughs) and, and, And your role as Olivia Pope in Scandal was a real breakthrough. I mean, it was a breakthrough show, um, itself on on several levels in terms of mm-hmm. it was a moment in social media that where the show was kind of ahead and you know workplace fashion and women in you know in the political process uh, all kinds mm. of things it's also pretty unbelievable to me to take in that at the time of this premiere um, you were the first. African American woman to star in a network TV drama since 1974. Yeah, 38 so, years. That is shocking. Yeah. And so I was, I think, 36 at the time. So it hadn't happened in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. Just, so I hadn't seen it. That idea uh-huh. of like, if you don't see it, you can't be it. Like, I, I wasn't sure if I could be it because I hadn't seen it. Um, and it was so exciting. And also terrifying because I felt the pressure of what everybody at the time described as a risk, you know, the risk of putting a black woman at the lead of a network drama. And I, I knew that if we weren't a success, that it could potentially mm, be another mm. 40 years oh, that's heavy. before that anybody heavy. had that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, looking back in success, it's thrilling because Mm -hmm. we were a success. And that wasn't just because we, you know, it wasn't like we were such a great show. We were a success. It's also that audiences were ready for it. Um, I do think we worked twice as hard because we knew what we were up against historically and culturally. Um, But audiences were ready. People were ready to either see somebody that looked like themselves in this space and audiences were ready to see somebody that wasn't who they were in this space. And so Mm. we were able to pull in audiences that were hungering for representation or hungering for inclusion and diversity and ride the wave of that moment. And I'm so grateful that our audiences showed showed up for us in that way. And that when you look back, it was because we were a success, it led to so many other shows with Viola Davis and Priyanka Chopra and Taraji P. Henson, right? Like suddenly it was no longer a risk to put a woman of color as the lead of a network drama. And I'm really proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, is something to be proud of. I mean, that must be incredible now, as you say, in hindsight, in looking hindsight. back and success <laughs> yes. to be able to say that. <laughs> I mean, something else that you write about, um, and, you know, again, this comes back to, this is your way of mining what it means to be human and what it means to be you, um, and how we become who we are. And you've said that, you know, every character that comes into your life you learn something about yourself. So Mm -hmm. how would you talk about how you became more Carrie Washington as you became Olivia Pope? Hmm. Well, I think it's so funny, you know, 
I said earlier in the interview that in many ways, this time in my life in writing this book has been my adventure in learning to put myself at the center of the story. And in effect, me being the lead character in the drama of my life. And I think playing that character allowed me to do that because I had spent a lot of my career playing a supportive role. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd played opposite two men who went on to win the Oscar for right. Best Leading Performance. You'd and, played Edie um, Amin's wife. You'd play mm -hmm. Ray, played Ray Charles' wife. <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah. I really, I had sort of maxed out on this supporting role of mm -hmm. like really pouring myself into uplifting and highlighting and amplifying somebody else's performance and in a really beautiful way that I'm super proud of and very grateful for. But when I stepped into this role on television, it was a different kind of responsibility. I was now number one on the call sheet mm -hmm. and the buck stopped with me and I was team captain. And so when the show ended, I did find myself in a place where I had learned to be number one. I'd learned to be more of a leader, um, not just as a character on the show, but also on set in terms of leading our cast and crew. Um, so she taught me a lot about that. She also taught me a lot about family. Olivia Pope. Is she? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, about family and about committing to people and about chosen family and finding the places where you belong. And, and then there was this element that I never quite understood around the complexity with the father role. And I, I struggled with knowing exactly what it is the character was trying to tell me hmm. about my relationship with my father. Mm. But I feel like that gift came after the show. Mm. What, say some more about that. How how did that come? Is, so this so this is kind of planted in you, but then it continues to develop even after the role has ended. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess I have in the notes of my scripts. I have all these annotations when I'm working on scenes. It's like, what is the theme that's being explored here about the father? Mm -hmm. What are the questions about the father? Why? It, why am I asked to put my father's needs before my own? Why is my father's truth trying to override my own, right? There were all of yeah. these, yeah. these dilemmas. And I, I couldn't quite, as I often can, I couldn't quite understand why those questions were being asked of me, Carrie. But when the show ended and my parents gave me some information about myself and my relationship with my dad, I suddenly realized that there were these themes that needed to be explored. So... So you're saying that something in you intuited, so it you could not have that answer you were searching for, no. but you knew there was something you didn't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. So do you want to say what that was? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, um, what, what, let me say first, though, that I think one of the gifts of getting this new information was that I felt like... I feel like I've been able to heal more of my relationship with my intuition and and mm. my knowingness, right? Because I had these vague notions that something was being kept from me, that I didn't know the full truth, that there was some complexity to the relationships that was that I was being protected from. I never knew what it was. And everyone around me was acting like that wasn't true. Mm. And so when I when it was confirmed that there was a big reveal, that there was information that was being kept from me, I felt empowered. I felt like I was being given a pathway back to my knowingness mm. and back to my instincts. So my parents, um, I guess over five years ago now, they sat me down. They texted me and told me that they needed to talk to me. And I think this was, was this right, that you got this text and you had just finished filming the last scenes? We it wasn't right. We had just finished. Um, it was a it was about a month after. Okay, it was All about right. a month after. Okay, and I got this text, and I went over to see my parents because that's not really the language of our family. We don't sit down and have serious talks often, and they informed me for the first time. I was about. I think I was just over forty. That um that my dad is not my biological father. Mm -hmm. 
And it was both shocking and also, and also it somewhat crystallized some sensibility that I had, but could never really articulate or understand or know. Mm -hmm. A relief in a sense of knowing that you were right, that there, that there, at least that there was that there something was that something. you didn't know. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. There was a sense of relief and, mm-hmm. and extreme curiosity, mm-hmm. like ex- profound curiosity and excitement mm-hmm. also. And then, you know, there was, <laughs> there was also then a sense of betrayal and a sense of, mm-hmm. and there was some anger and some sadness and disappointment. But all of that, you know, it's been kind of framed by this, curiosity and gratitude to Mm. be in truth Mm. finally Support for On Being with Krista Tippett comes from the Fetzer Institute. Fetzer supports a movement of organizations that are applying spiritual solutions to society's toughest problems. Learn more at Fetzer.org. Something I'd like to talk to you about... um, I don't interview for On Being um, many people who are incredibly famous, right? I don't, mm-hmm. and I mean we're really low. I go, I go light on celebrity, mm-hmm. and there are many mm-hmm. reasons for that. But part of it is just that people who are celebrities get interviewed a lot, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I try to have this space where, where we're doing something different. So, so in this sense, um, and you're somebody I've followed and um I've met you and there's this thoughtfulness that you know that I'm I'm really excited to pursue but I I would like to ask you um you know about this matter of fame and celebrity because you write about this in the book too and it's something mm. that I feel like we hardly know how to talk about mm, culturally mm-hmm, even mm-hmm. though even though almost to a one we participate in this cultural drama of celebrity, like we we co-create it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also, I'm curious because as I say, I feel like you're a student of the human condition as much as an actor and you happen to be, have become a celebrity. Um, so are you willing to talk about this a little yes, bit? Yes, yes, You know, yes. there is this, and like, you know, so for me, I have this, minuscule experience of this, right? Of, <laughs> of my, In my house, you're super famous, okay, Krista, right. but okay. okay. <laughs> but, you know, when people know me, it's it's probably my voice that they know. And, right, it has, and right. even so, when I get recognized kind of out of the blue, I find it really jarring mm-hmm. um, because also... You know, there's something weirdly dehumanizing about it mm, because they mm-hmm. feel intimate with you. You, you know, I often people don't tell you their name; they know your name. But it has occurred mm. to me as I've had that just tiny echo of an experience you've had that how jarring it would be for it to be your face that is mm. known. Um, mm-hmm. And you actually tell this really mm. heartbreaking story um, of getting an abortion. How old were you when when that happened with with a made up name? Uh-huh. Yes, um, I was in my twenties, my yeah. mid twenties, and you're there in the room. You're you're not there with your real name, understandably, and the nurse tells you that you look like a movie star, mm-hmm. and she says your real name, and you wrote that girl from the movies, that girl from the magazines. It was my name. But the version she was calling out had nothing to do with me. And so in that moment, I didn't know who I was or where I stood. I only know that my name belonged to public spaces in a way that made privacy unavailable to me. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it's, um, I think it's one of the things that I felt really drew me, um, 
oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this because of the strike. Ugh. Ugh. Um, I know. Uh, let me think about how I can do this. Yeah. Actually, it's funny. It's this theme of loss of privacy has come up in my work at different times. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it was important for me to tell that story in this work is because our right to privacy is so under attack in this larger way as in women. The, yes, mm -hmm. our right to our bodies, um, our right to privacy and information, like our, our right to privacy is dangerously under attack. And it's something I think we all need to be thinking about how important it is that our lives belong to us and that we be given the space and dignity to make choices that are right for us and that are nobody else's business, which feels, it feels like a contradiction to say that as I write it in a book that's going out into the world. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's to, to say like, that was one of those moments where I understood the value of something because I was losing it. Yeah, and you also are really honest about this irony. On the one hand, you're playing Olivia Pope, who is flawless, right? <laughs> like flawless in her yes. physical being and everything that wraps around her, right, is flawless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then at the same time, you know, you're losing your anonymity and you're becoming more self-conscious. You describe experiences of becoming more self-conscious about how your body looks and the way it's presented and projected mm -hmm. after you've had a public appearance, after you've after images have been published. And I just think about that, that hyperventilating little girl, because she was still mm. inside you. Mm -hmm. And just what a this experience that you have is part of our life together also. Mm. I, I just don't know. I, I just kind of want to name that, and I, I don't know if there's anything else you would want to say about it. But It's interesting. The, I, for me, this is, this is a very different moment for me, right? Like I've never mm. done a series of interviews where this, the topic of the conversation is a story that is my story. Mm -hmm. I'm very accustomed to talking about a movie or a television show or a play and to unpack that narrative and pull on the threads and the themes because I may feel aligned with them, but it's not exactly me. Right, right. This moment is really different because I'm talking about me and it is a part of fame that I have really rejected. Mm. Um, I have been so careful to maintain my privacy um, because I've had moments like when I had my abortion or I had a, you know, a very public engagement that ended. And, and I found myself unable to control the flow of information. And so I thought, okay, going forward in my life, I really want to make sure that I'm keeping my private life private. Yeah. I feel like what I'm saying is that as you open up the fullness of yourself, you're also reflecting on this weird thing that has come with the particular mm -hmm. gifts mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. um and profession that that are yours. Yes. Um and yet, as I say, it's something that our culture that we all partake in. It's so true. It's funny mm -hmm. because I talk about how I, first for me, acting became my love at first because I got to be other people right. because I could escape myself. I could escape my feelings of loneliness, my feelings of disconnection, my feelings of identity confusion. Yeah. But then as I progressed through my career, I realized that acting was actually a safe place to reveal myself because I could reveal some of my emotional truths and my beliefs and my um, my struggles. I could reveal them behind the mask of a character. Like I could mm. speak my truth and you thought that it was the truth of the character, even though it was my mm. truth coming mm. through her. Mm -hmm. And so then this feels almost like the third evolutionary 
um, phase in my evolution of my relationship with myself as an actor that Mm -hmm. I first came to the characters to lose myself. I then came to the characters to express myself. And now I am expressing myself and my relationship with the characters, but I'm truly without the mask expressing myself. And I didn't come to acting to do that. That feels like a byproduct of celebrity that I even have the opportunity to do it. Now that I know my story, Mm -hmm. I'm less afraid to step into this role of being in the public eye as myself. Right. And you're, and I, <laughs> I, I do kind of feel like this, this intentionality that I see that runs all the way through you as a human being from a very young age and that you brought to acting also has equipped you, right, to get to mm. this point mm. so that where this celebrity thing might the fame, you know, can be so dangerous for, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, you talk about, and I don't know if you've talked about this before you write about, you know, issues with food and exercise and, um, you know, that this can really be dangerous for people, but you've really lived your way into this place. I mean, you know, you've even said, as you study a character you take on, you you actually try to take on their good habits and make them mm-hmm. your own. And you wrote somewhere <laughs> one role at a time. They were saving me. That's just so fascinating to hear about. Yeah, because I felt so... I I felt like I didn't have healthy boundaries. I know that's such a buzzword now, but I didn't have enough sensibility around what were the structures and disciplines that were right for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel empowered to know necessarily where I began and somebody else ended because I was always in this sort of people-pleasing perfectionism, wanting to be who somebody else needed me to be. But a character became something to devote myself to. My acting Mm. was like a devotional practice where I could say... I am willing to submit to the structures and disciplines of this narrative, this role, to get to the best possible performance, the best possible truth. So I could wake up every morning and run when I was doing a movie playing a shoplifter where I had to run for the last 10 (laughs) minutes of the movie and I knew that that's what was required of me of the role. But when the movie ended, I wasn't enough. I didn't feel like I was enough of a reason to wake up and run. Mm. I needed Mm. these characters to inspire me to move toward goodness, greatness, excellence, purpose, maybe Mm. is the right word. Mm. It's funny Mm. because, you know, that's, that's the part that was missing when you asked about my upbringing and where spirituality fits into it. Mm. It was actually my relationship with food and with my body that was the first thing that got me on my knees. Like Mm -hmm. my first experience with real prayer, like Mm -hmm. really begging some power greater than me to help me out of a situation that felt bigger than me. My first experience with that was around food Mm -hmm. because I felt so utterly powerless to make loving decisions and mm-hmm. to not to really not use food and exercise as a weapon. And so that was my first my first intimate relationship with mm. spirit was part of my recovery around food and exercise and body dysmorphia. Mm. Mm. Thank you. thank you for that for offering that. Um I I don't want to finish before we talk about other kinds of roles you've had mm-hmm. that feel mm-hmm. really important to me in terms of how you channel and also invite um, the human condition through acting and and how you've evolved as a person, like who Carrie Washington is in her fu- fullness. So, of course, you know, there's little fires everywhere. Mm. Um, there's Django Unchained. And there's American Sun, which I was so fortunate to see mm. you play on Broadway, which also became mm-hmm. a, a Netflix show. And I'm, I just want to give a little synopsis um, as and just for people who aren't familiar with it. You, I mean, now when when was that 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 
started on Broadway. What year? It was pre-pandemic. It was pre-pandemic. It was right after Scandal. Um, so yeah. I want to say, oh gosh, I don't know the year, maybe 19? Uh, yeah. I think it may have been those, 2019. Those pre-pandemic or years that now uh-huh. feel like ancient history. So <laughs> yes. yeah, and so right, right. It was right after Scandal and there you are on stage for all but three minutes of an hour and a half, wearing jeans. I don't. I could. I didn't see that you were wearing makeup. Um, it could not have been a different character. It's at a Miami police station. Um, it says on a day this coming June, your black son Jamal has not come home. You know vaguely that there's been some incident with the police. It's a black mother and a white father and a black policeman and a white policeman. You are that mother in center point, Kendra. Tell me, I mean, that same question I asked you about what what did you learn from Olivia Pope about being Carrie Washington? What did you learn from Kendra? What did she teach you? You know, when I was doing those amazing seven seasons of television, in the course of that time, I, in my off season, like in the couple of months off that I had every year, I began to build my own family. Mm-hmm. I got married during one hiatus. I had gave birth to two children during different hiatuses, all during the course of that show. Yeah. But the character never became a mother. And that was a conscious decision on the part of our showrunner, Shonda Rhimes. And it was one that I struggled with because you know, my body was changing as I was carrying another life, building a brain and and limbs. Mm, And and I felt the pressure to remain, as you described her, flawless. And and I, I, there was this really challenging tension between who I was in real life and who the character, who I felt the character needed to be. But Shonda, it was important to Shonda that that character not become a mother. In fact, I had the first on-camera abortion procedure as part of, in the life of our show um, because my character was so committed to not being a parent. So when the show ended, I found myself really gravitating toward material where I could explore the vulnerability of motherhood because what I understood was that that character was a fixer. She was... She was the most powerful person in almost every room. And there is an inherent vulnerability in being the parent of a black child Mm. that you cannot escape. So she would have been less of a superhero Uh. if she had become the mother of a black child. And I say particularly not a black mother because I've had this conversation with white women who have adopted black children, right? There is, it's a specificity around raising a black child and the powerlessness that you feel up against these systems that are created to limit and destroy your child. Mm. Um, And so it was a real gift for me to be able to take on a play like American Son where I could really put myself on stage and swing the pendulum in the opposite direction, not be the most powerful person in the room, actually be the person with the least amount of power and agency and to, to embody all of the vulnerabilities of what it means to parent a black child, to step into the the worst nightmare of what it means to be the mother of a black child and even to explore the other side of what it's possible an interracial relationship might be like, right? On the television show, I was living this fantasy of, you know, a white man that loved her so much. He literally created an imaginary war to save her, right? Like she was Helen of Troy. And was the most powerful man in the world, by the way. Yes, exactly. But in this play, Mm -hmm. this interracial relationship was not the fantasy. It wasn't the honeymoon. It was filled with all the complexity of what might not go right. Where where might you not be speaking the same language and where might your cultural misunderstandings rub, against, rub up against each other so much that it leads to the destruction of a family? Yeah. Um, so it was really exciting for me to get to explore mm. the opposition, the underbelly, kind of the uncharted territory 
of of what it could mean to be in an interracial relationship and to parent a black child. But parenthood in general is something that, you know, once I once I had more time and could bring all of the experience I was learning or the feelings I was having as a mother into my work, I really leapt at that opportunity. Well, I mean, just that word fixer, right? I mm-hmm. mean, the thing that you learn when you become a parent is there is no fixing, right? That's right. <laughs> There's a lot of like witnessing uh-huh. <laughs> and holding feeling space like for. A failure and wondering yes. how you could have done that better. Yes. There's a lot of um, mending yeah. and growing <laughs> and right. learning, yeah. compromising. Yeah. yeah. Fixing is just not yeah. in the vocabulary of any, <laughs> just to start with that. I mean, I will say, you know, something that really moved me um, in that. Broadway theater was, um, first of all, it was, you know, the play is intense and not funny, but mm. there was mm. humor, right? There, there was. There was, yes. <laughs> and, and something that was really, and I can't remember if I, if I said this to you when we met um, briefly, but... You know, it was a really racially mixed audience, Mm -hmm. and people laughed at different things. Mm -hmm. And what I also noticed is that people would then wonder if they should have laughed Mm -hmm. Um, differently, right? The different Mm -hmm. kinds of identities in the room. And you, um, what I learned from you was that you had so... Like so, a lot of your your preparation for this particular role was also just really considering the experience of the audience, mm. and creating resources and experiences to draw that out. Yes, we. It was the first time in the history of Playbill that they allowed us to put a discussion guide into the program, so that every person who came to the play had some framework and some resources and some prompts and um, ways to learn more and grow from what they saw. Because originally we had created this discussion guide and resource list to just place on a table in the back of the theater for when people were leaving the Mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. But people were so shell-shocked at the end of the play, just like... I would watch audiences stumble out of the play and they weren't stopping to pick up anything. They oh, were so barely you didn't know this, breathing. You, this all evolved and th- this wasn't in Playbill yeah. in the beginning. Right. We were. Uh-huh. We thought people will just pick it up as they go out and it'll right. be great. But people, we, we realized we have to put it in the Playbill because when you go home and you're trying to wrap your head around what you just watched, which everybody shared was part of their experience, you're going to pick up your Playbill and say like, where do I know that actor from? from and wait, who directed this thing and who wrote it? Yeah. And that's when I wanted the discussion guide to be in their hands. I wanted them to have resources and tools and a framework and support already in their home so that they had some way to process these feelings and emotions and thoughts that were coming up because yeah. of what they just saw. I mean, also, um, Eric Garner's mother came to the play, mm-hmm. and Philando mm-hmm. Castile's mother mm-hmm. came, and Sandra Bland's sister came, mm-hmm. and I—I I have to ask. I mean, again, this was pre twenty twenty, and I—I I just wonder. We've been talking this whole time about how much you learn from every role you play, and just how did that experience kind of flow into these years that have come since? How is that with you? Hmm. Sometimes, sometimes I think I'm just so lucky that I get to be used as a vessel for people to know themselves better Mm. and to see themselves more. Mm. And that play was definitely one of those experiences where these mothers of the movement and sisters and cousins who had lost people to police brutality, they felt so seen. Mm. They felt like the world knew them after the tragedy, but that we let them into the hearts of these mothers 
to know what it's like before the tragedy occurs. Oh, well, you're in that waiting yes. room as Kendra yes. was. Yes. Right. Yes. That that we we let people into their humanity before the loss. Mm. And that meant so much to them. So I, I feel that to me is one of the greatest gifts of what I get to do is I feel like I get to be used for other people to see and know themselves more and to know how much they matter. And I guess that's why I have so much joy and why it's so moving to me when people are having that experience reading Thicker Than Water because I still feel like even though I'm not playing a character, like I'm seeing that my telling my story is also allowing people to feel more seen and understood. Mm -hmm. It really, it feels like that's the role of art, right? Whether it's like a literary work of a, a memoir or whether it's music or theater or film or television, like it is this opportunity for us to become more intimate with our own humanity and the, mm -hmm. the deep hu humanity of somebody else. And I just feel like if there's anything that we need in culture right now, mm -hmm. it's the courage and the willingness to know ourselves more and to know each other more and to make room for like the unconditional acceptance of each other's humanity. Not, not every behavior, not every decision mm -hmm. do we have to sign off and approve, but to, to make space for each other's humanity and belonging feels like I, I think so much of what we need. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a camera metaphor. <laughs> okay. As we as we land here, I want to because we're that's really such an incredible place to get to. I want to kind of pull the lens out wide. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I think I feel like you just walked us here. This role, the role that we all are given right now of being alive in this time that we mm -hmm. inhabit. And yes, having moved through this pandemic and the many ruptures that have occurred, you know, in, in these years and since that we couldn't have imagined a few years ago. And so you kind of as a human, as an actor, as a mother, um, in your calling as an anthropologist, what, mm -hmm. like, what anthropological <laughs> questions and curiosities are you holding now about stepping into this this time ahead and this this role that I think of as this calling that we all have to kind of stand before this world. Um, yeah, that's kind of just a big, messy, huge question. But yeah, what questions are you holding? What curiosities? Mm. I think this question that I, I didn't even remember was in the commencement speech. So I really appreciate you pulling that forward. But this question of how we become who we are is the most important one right now. Mm. Because it's the question I think that will allow us to have a bit more humility around the decisiveness of, you know, where we can and cannot compromise, like, mm. where, you know, where we are alike and where we are dissimilar. If we, if we have the willingness to ask ourselves, like, how did I become who I am? And how did they become who they are? I think it allows us all to accept more of our messiness and to let ourselves be more human, to understand like we weren't born perfect. Somebody who was dealing with their own trauma tried to raise us the best we could. Yeah. And now with our own traumas, we're trying to raise somebody else the best we can. <laughs> yes. And to have that kind of gentle acceptance of each other that we're just like these beings in process doing the best we can with the tools we have. I think that could give us more space to be able to listen to each other, to appreciate each other, to be less afraid of each other. And I think that's where we need to be operating more from like the, 
the messy humanity of each other and yeah. less from deciding who our enemies are and um, deciding who's good and who's bad. Like, you know, we have a joke in my family that my favorite genre is a is a villain origin story because I just, I love <laughs> those movies where you get to see how the bad guys become the bad guys because the truth is nobody's born a bad guy. And, right? and like it's very all that they few got wounded, us. right? <laughs> yes, yeah. everyone, everyone has a wound mm-hmm. that leads to, there's a, I love this book, The Origins of You, that's all about these wounds, right? Like mm-hmm. we have these wounds and they, how we process those wounds and move forward through them is how is who we are. So asking that question, not taking it for granted that there are good guys and bad guys, but knowing that everybody's good, we're doing the best we can at varying degrees. It's really hard to hold on to that belief with some of our members, but of mm-hmm. society. But you know, even when I think about people that I really, really, really have great fear and contempt for former presidents that I will not name. I think, you know, that person was hurt. That person was hurt. That person has survived tremendous abuse. How they have metabolized it to continue to abuse others is unacceptable, but I have to remember where it comes from so that I don't perpetuate it. What an incredible ending to a beautiful conversation, Carrie. Thank you so much. What a joy. Thank you. Oh, this is such a pleasure. I mean, even just you reading the book is such a pleasure. And really, I'm so honored. So, so honored. You know what? Can I add one more thing that I'm not sure that I said? Yeah. Um, I I want, I guess I want to say that for me, this learning of how I became who I am has been so important because it's helped me connect more deeply with myself and my intuition and all the things we talked about. But also in learning that my parents kept this secret from me, I was able to witness more of their humanity, right? Yeah. Like yeah. their fear, their fear that I wouldn't love them unconditionally, that they would lose me, that I would walk away And what it became, what this truth telling actually became was an opportunity for me to say to my dad, you know, every time that I've said, I love you up until this point, it's been on the condition of a lie. Hmm. It's been, I love you. And you've thought she loves me because she thinks I'm her dad, whether you've thought Hmm. it consciously or unconsciously. And so the opportunity of this truth sharing was that I got to say to my parents, now you get to see what it's like for me to love you unconditionally. That when you told me the truth and you see that I don't go anywhere, that I love you more, that I feel closer Knowing to you. Everything. Yes, that yeah. that's, that's the greatest gift that our family has been given. Mm. And so I think that even when we're afraid to ask the question of like, how did I become who I am? How did you become who you are? Even when we're afraid of it, I think it's worth taking the deep dive because the truth can bring us to something that's even more beautiful than what we could have imagined. Washington is founder of the production company Simpson Street. Her many credits include the television series Little Fires Everywhere, the Broadway play and Netflix film American Sun, and the film Django Unchained. She starred as Olivia Pope on seven seasons of the hit TV series Scandal. Carrie Washington's memoir is Thicker Than Water. And this episode of On Being was produced with consideration of the ongoing SAG-AFTRA strike and with external legal guidance. In distributing this episode, we attest to our belief that no statements made involve promotion of struck work in violation of the SAG-AFTRA strike order. The On Being Project is Chris Hegel, Loren Drummerhausen, Eddie Gonzalez, Lillian Vo, Lucas Johnson, Suzette Burley, Zach Rose, Colleen Check, 
Julie Seipel, Gretchen Honnold, Padre Gautuma, Gautam Shrikishan, April Adamson, Ashley Herr, Amy Chatelaine, Cameron Musar, Kayla Edwards, Tiffany Champion, Juliette Dallas Feeney, Anissa Hale, and Andrea Prevo. On Being is an independent, nonprofit production of the On Being Project. We are located on Dakota land. Our lovely theme music is provided and composed by Zoe Keating. Our closing music was composed by Gautam Shrikishan. And the last voice you hear singing at the end of our show is Cameron Kinghorn. Our funding partners include the Hearthland Foundation, helping to build a more just, equitable, and connected America, one creative act at a time. The Fetzer Institute, supporting a movement of organizations applying spiritual solutions to society's toughest problems. Find them at Fetzer.org. Calliopeia Foundation, dedicated to cultivating the connections between ecology, culture, and spirituality. Supporting initiatives and organizations that uphold sacred relationships with the living earth. Learn more at Calliopeia.org. The Osprey Foundation, a catalyst for empowered, healthy, and fulfilled lives. And the Lilly Endowment, an Indianapolis-based private family foundation dedicated to its founders' interests in religion, community development, and education. On Being is produced by On Being Studios in Minneapolis, Minnesota.